Stu Gatz here. Whether you're into podcasts about ghastly crimes or hip-hop rhymes, there's always something new to discover on Spotify. With a mix of originals and many of the world's most popular shows, listening to podcasts on Spotify is easy. Just open the app, tap Browse, and dive into their growing library. Subscribe to your favorites, including our entire archive, so you'll never miss a show. You can also download podcasts for those moments when you're up in the air or going underground. Podcasts on Spotify are streaming right now. Go check them out today. Guys, wouldn't your wife or girlfriend love it if you treated her to the very best this Christmas? Now you can with the world's softest pajamas by Pajamagram. Created by a team of pajama experts, the world's softest PJs are lighter than a cloud, softer than a bunny, like cashmere, only better. She'll love how heavenly they feel. Includes free gift packaging and Christmas delivery is guaranteed. So visit pajamagram.com or call 1-800-GIVE-PJs. This is the Dan Lebatar Show with the Stugatz Podcast. This isn't where I thought we were going to start our Football Monday, great day of football yesterday. Um, but I have a question for you guys because I'm reading a stat right here and I'm having a hard time that's believing it's so, even though I do believe it to be so. So I'll ask the questions. Let's just do stat of the day and we'll fact check our stat when, uh, <laughs> after I'm done revealing it because <laughs> I've, I, I, I totally believe this stat and I don't believe this stat, um, because I feel like my memory is failing me on So something. it's a stat of the day that we're not certain no, but I'm is pretty a real sure, stat. Okay. I'm pretty sure it's, it's, it's correct, but let's All check right. it out. The re- one of the reasons I'm questioning it is because it comes from at evil Andy Dalton. Oh. And I haven't had time to sort of like check my sources on that. Let me needs ex- vetting. Yeah. Yes. Well, let me explain uh, to you very clearly. I don't think it needs vetting and pretty <laughs> sure is always no. good enough for me. Okay. okay. All right. Well, okay. Very good. So not exactly a journalistic principle we could all live by, but let's just play the short, short stat of the day intro so that we can gather ourselves real quick. Start of the day, start of the day, it is the start of the day. Start of the day, start of the day, it is the start of the day. Start of the day, start of the day, it is the start of the day. Start of the day, start of the day, it is the start of the day. So, at Evil Andy Dalton says, back in 2003, Marvin Lewis took over a Bengals team that had only five playoff wins in franchise history. In 2017, after 15 years, Marvin Lewis will leave a Bengals team that has only five playoff wins in franchise history. I seem to remember somewhere the Bengals winning a playoff game against a Houston or a Tom Savage or something. Like, it wasn't a real playoff win, but it was just a... Marv Lewis has survived for 15 years in Cincinnati yep. without a playoff win. They mm-hmm. lost those games to Yates. He, oh, so he was losing those games to Yates. Those were the games that Bill O'Brien was winning. Like those, those are the games that are, are the Bill O'Brien equivalent. The yeah, Bill O'Brien. Kubiak. Right. Whoever, whoever. That is amazing. How does that even happen? He's 0-7 in the postseason, How but just that... getting to the playoffs was enough for Cincinnati. Evidently, yes. but they... Cincinnati, man, raise your standards. <laughs> the NFL Stat of the Day is brought to you by KFC. Get your family the gift of a $20 fill-up from KFC. You put it on the table instead of under the tree, but they'll still love it. KFC, it's finger-licking good. All right, so uh, I think the most interesting story from a most interesting football weekend, I will get into the Steelers. Patriots game because that was amazing for a million different reasons, not the least of which was like we are now in 2017 uh, at the height of technology. I mean, we're measuring things with an index card and chains in a multi billion dollar sport <laughs> and things that have always been a catch throughout the history and time. Like that was a touchdown catch the Steelers had at any time that any of us have been watching football at any level. Yeah. That is a touchdown catch. And the idea that technology and Blandino and Pereira and these letter of the rule guys don't offer you that judges, the reason we have judges, we have laws and the reason we have judges is because we have judges to interpret the laws a monkey could interpret. A monkey could adhere to the letter of the law. 
common sense. The reason we have arbiters is so they can apply common human decency right. to law. That that was a touchdown in any time that any of us have been watching football. I mean, refs got it right, but the law stinks. Well, I mean, the rule I, just I, absolutely I know, but stinks. your arbiters, your you, you okay, fine. You either need better laws or better arbiters, but what you can't have is a game of that magnitude in a collision sport where it's acquisition of real estate through violence. You can't have the rule book deciding stuff that's nonsense. You also have inconsistencies in the rule book where if a running back just gets it over the plane, it's a touchdown. Uh, but a wide receiver just gets it over the no, plane, and it's not a no, touchdown. But here, we don't need more rules with our sports. Like... We, we don't need to make this stuff such micro, so microscopic that we miss the macro. What's pretty striking is that for what felt like three minutes, Nance and Romo are talking about a review and wondering aloud. They're what, saying what they it's even... obvious. They're saying, I don't even know. This is obviously a touchdown. For three minutes, they don't even know what the refs are looking at. They don't even know what the refs are looking at. And they had me for three minutes looking at the knee to see, well, wait a minute. Does he have to be touched if the knee is down? No, right. he doesn't have to be touched. That's college football. Like, that's... the. And so I'm like, what are they looking at as well? That's a touchdown. We all know that's a touchdown. And then it becomes, oh, this is taking a long time. It's like, who wants to play football that way? Think about what you're watching, okay? Think about what that is the culmination of. And I don't even think this was the most interesting thing from yesterday because I think Jerry Richardson was the most interesting thing from yesterday. I think the Patriots enjoy playing football that way because uh, it always seems to work out their okay, way. No, yes, they, <laughs> and that was a fun game for all involved. But what I'm talking about is the construct around football that employs people like Pereira and Blandino and creates an industry of making officiating more important, as if that's what any of us want with our sports, making officiating more important. But if we're going to make that more important, then we need arbiters who are actually good at interpreting spirit of the rule because I could do letter of the rule. Right. Like if you if you tell me, I could sit there and look at that and say, yeah, the rule is that that's not a catch. But I can also look at that and say that that's clearly a touchdown. Dan, I agree with you. I think everyone agrees with you. I'm not certain the officials have the authority to just do, hey, okay. my interpretation of the rule. Um, well, but I would say, what's the point of having officials unless they have that authority? You're right. I don't have an answer for you, but I don't think that the official sits there and says, hey, you know what? I think that's a touchdown. Forget about the rules. I think it's a touchdown. I'm going to give him six points. You can't do that. Well, th that game was it was fascinating for a lot of different reasons. But again, I will say to you this. Think about what we're talking about there. We are talking about the culmination of a game through 13 weeks. This game is violent real estate, real estate acquisition. It's acquiring real estate through violence. We've seen 13 weeks of that. That team in its skybox had a guy that we thought that that fight for those inches, we thought it paralyzed him very recently. That you would have these guys crawling and scraping with their bodies, risking brain damage for the inches of that real estate. And then at the very top of the AAFC, where you are trying to determine the value of who will get the advantage of home field during the playoffs, at the height of all that violence, what you're deciding is what gets to advance. You got to go to your rule book to check it, and you got to go to management and people on the side who are doing the collisions, and then you don't even give them the power to give that victory to what the Patriots know was the earned victor. Because the Patriots would look at that and say, if we made that catch, we would know that that's a touchdown, clearly a touchdown. And that's what I'm saying. Like, it's really deeply unfair to the it people, yes. the people involved with this, that that's what we've done to sports. Because you know what we've done to sports? We've gotten the technology to such a place that we've turned these important officials into all these golf narcs that we don't like. That looked like a touchdown until we started inspecting the rules. It looked like a touchdown to everybody in the world who has ever watched football. Right. I don't know, man, I, I, I hear you. I don't know if I just want to leave it to the interpretation of a 67 year old man. I okay. just don't like, no, like, and it's, it's going gonna, gonna to work against my team one day and I'm going to be I, very I upset. I know, but about what it. I'm telling you is this stuff is so arbitrary that later that night in a different game that Dallas needed, you left it to the judgment of another 67 year old man with an index card measuring with chains to see if that <laughs> real estate acquisition was one inch more or one inch less. So you're trusting the judgment of the 67-year-old person sometimes right, to decide games. So let them decide the games. <laughs> like, let them decide the games in the way that's most obviously fair. Now, he's saying that was a uh, reaffirmation of what, he, of what the guys up in the booth had already told him. 
He said he just used that card to reaffirm what it is that they no, told but him. You, you understand what it's I'm saying? Fun, it was a laugh out loud funny. He was laughing at it. They're measuring with it. No, the, the index card's not ridiculous. They're any more ridiculous. The fact that we're measuring with chain with a chain gang in 2017, when like I could be sitting on the moon drinking a beverage watching this game because of the technology and this multi-billion dollar industry still has things being decided when they in tennis can do it with radars from the sky. I could watch that game soon from Mars in the comfort of my own living room with technology. I will be able to summon a servant with an app that brings him or her to me and I Got a 67-year-old guy down there with an index card and a couple of buddies who are carrying a chain around trying to measure for the deciding victor when people are risking paralysis and brain damage? All right. Enjoy your Sunday. Don Lebatard. Buke of Gardenias. The hashtag, hot hashtag erotica. Stugats. Dimitri, what is Buke Gardenias? I like, I collect the heart and then I log out, right? <laughs> Off the Karamis' account. This is the Dan Lebatar Show with the Stugats on ESPN Radio. Download the, from the James Brown account, Dimitri. <laughs> yes, the CBS guy. Not the other James Brown. <laughs> The, the, the other, the James, other, other, the James other, Brown. the other, other James Brown, Dimitri. <laughs> the 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 pregame show with the film on it, the old people. <laughs> um, listen, listen, Stugat, so that you understand how stupid this all is. This this way that we care about this thing on Sunday. Mm-hmm. Did you see how the Dallas uh, Raiders game? ended with like it's not just the gene serator index card measuring an inch with chains at the end it's car you know running toward the end zone and the difference between a touchdown and victory and him just being a goof and throwing the ball at the pylon is you know inches that right there is literally the difference (laughs) between eight and six and six and eight the eight and six the cowboys are and the six and six six and eight the raiders are that's the difference inches it and what you saw in the pittsburgh patriots game the difference is nothing and philadelphia last week won on a fourth down play where alshon jeffrey is grabbing the ball with his fingertips like the difference in these games it the great genius of football is we treat all these things as if they matter but it's a series of random results that aren't really telling you Anything about who's better. It's why they call it a game of inches, Dan. It is. Yep. I mean, you finally have come it around is. to that. It is. Yes, this is great. What a landmark really day is. show history. It is. Yeah. It is a game of inches. <laughs> I mean, think about those games we saw yesterday. Yeah. The difference between the Steelers and the Patriots is that the real difference is, and the real amazing thing is that Tomlin's got Antonio Brown, he's got Le'Veon Bell, he's got Ben Roethlisberger, and Belichick keeps beating him with Rex Burkett. Like <laughs> that's hurt, by right? The way. Right. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that the fact that those teams are equal and that we often think the Patriots are better is the greatest indictment I can make of the non-blinking Mike Tomlin, <laughs> who tells you to be tough in every way possible, except when he's got the ball in the lead late and he goes conservative with all the skill, talent in the world. Because he's shriveling against the fearless Belichick. That's amazing. Just shriveled. Yeah, everyone's shriveled. Like Ben Roethlisberger, with a Hall of Fame quarterback, they, by the they, way. They, oh, no, but that Hall of Fame quarterback shriveled too. At the end of that game, when it became winning time, when it became the very last thing you have to do to overcome everybody, the officiating, the Patriots, everybody. Ben Roethlisberger made a play the same way you or I would have tried to make it. <laughs> Just straight stupidity. And it's how you or I in that situation, while urinating ourselves, would have also made that dumb play. And it's a play that Pete Carroll had his team make against the Patriots as we determined value on that day. Yep. And it's very and it's and it's very rarely something that happens against the Patriots when at the very end of the game, it happened to the Falcons last year, where at the end of the game, you because they've been in that situation so many times, because Brady has thrown three hundred passes against the Steelers without an interception before yesterday, and because he's now got do you know what the number of his game winning drives are? Do you know what the number is? 54, 50 51. Man. Like Romo was looking at that number and was like, is that right? Is that yeah. that number can't be right. Right. And Romo had plenty of those. I it's, think he's just behind Peyton Manning, who couldn't win the big game, by the way. <laughs> I think I might be willing to grant you guys, uh, you know, for all I say about coaching, you know, we overestimate the value of coaching. 
right? Brad Stevens can't win anything meaningful until he gets his players, even though we know he's a good coach. Right. Eric Spolster, we know he's a good coach. He can't win anything meaningful until he gets good players. Now, Dan, they told, according to Roethlisberger and the reporters, uh, Ben wanted to take a knee, and the guys were in his headset saying, no, do not take a knee, throw the ball. Like, they were trying to get the No, no, throwing there. the ball is fine. Throwing right. the ball there is the dumb there, thing. Dumb, You're not yes. going to fool the Patriots no. at the end of the game with anything you do. They're not no. idiots. They've been in those situations too many times. Well, been in those situations after the game. The Patriots said they practiced that just about every single day. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you mean clock it. There's no way with no timeouts they were telling him to take a knee on, on, on third Right, down. no, spike it. Spike yeah. it is what he meant. Yes, clock the ball and just take the field goal. And if they were telling him, you but, know, go ahead and throw it. Not that. Don't but, throw that. But, but all of the late game situation stuff. Like, think about they, the Pittsburgh Steelers, because they were cowards at the end of that game with the better people on the field. All the things that happened at the last five minutes of the game was a normally ballsy team that used to go for two point conversions all the time because of how much skill talent they have shriveled up. If Belichick had these players, he would be running the league. Well, he already is running the league, yeah. but he'd be running the league even more. He'd be like if he had these Pittsburgh players. Oh my God! Uh, Alan so Tyler, so Tomlin, for all his tough talk, goes totally scared over the last five minutes of the game. Just conservative, 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 careful with all that skill, talent, and then when the referee makes the call, you thought you had it won. Now everything is collapsing on you. Bleep, man. The Patriots were here with the Falcons last year in the Super Bowl at the height of everything. They didn't collapse at the end. Everything was precision, and Atlanta just totally fell apart because the Patriots have been there in that situation. Think about what happened after second down. Not after the call that we're all howling about and before the stupidity of the final play. Think about what happened before that. They've got time in 30 seconds. They need 10 yards. This defense is exhausted. Their offensive players are all better. They need 10 yards. What do they do? they got no timeouts. On the previous drive, Romo told you what was coming. He says the Patriots have to run the ball here one time to get the Steelers to use their last time out. The Patriots ran the ball. The Steelers allowed a touchdown. They weren't ready for the run. They were expecting. Romo told you. Yep. This has to be a run. They've got it. Tomlin, not, they weren't ready for it. They weren't ready for a run. They scored from seven yards out. Now, think about what happened, Stugat. After the world collapses, we're all howling about whether that's a touchdown or not. The Steelers run a running play with 30 seconds left and no timeouts to the left that gets tackled in bounds or a short, a short pass or whatever that was that gets tackled. You cannot run a play there that's going to get tackled in bounds. You have to have plays. All the plays at the end of that game have to be so that you have a, 30 seconds is plenty of time to have three downs or to score a touchdown or two. It's plenty of time. They lost all their time and were in a total panic by the end. And that never happens to the Patriots. It was a short pass to uh, Hayward Bay yeah, for three yards but, but that he stayed in bounds. He's got to get right. out of bounds. Yeah. He does, and the play call was for him to get out of bounds. They didn't execute, but it wasn't the worst thing in the world because, okay, you're going to leave Tom Brady 30 seconds. You know that's too much. So that's why they went up there, all right, let, let's chill out. Fake spike, let the clock keep but running. Mike, and the what I'm saying lacked. is that's the Patriots. That is the Patriots and fear of the Patriots pushing you to your brink until eventually you panic because everything you're doing is constant. They don't care what you do. They're running the ball to get the timeout from the seven yard line. They don't care what, whether they're leaving Ben Roethlisberger 50 seconds, but Ben Roethlisberger and Tomlin fear leaving Tom Brady. Even five seconds. Understandably so. But you don't think that Belichick, because I was thinking that at the time, Deion Lewis should have just fell at the one-yard line. You don't think, like, that wasn't, Belichick wasn't processing, whoa, I just left Roethlisberger 59 seconds at a timeout here? They called a running play to get a timeout. The running play worked for a touchdown. They were fine with it. And should have been. And should have been. Like, I'm telling you, man, everybody in that league, that league fears Belichick so much. All those coaches, when it, when it comes time to be brave and actually risk some, some, some courage, when it comes time for them to be brave, they shrivel up against him. Except for Tom Coughlin. He just nah, shriveled up. Stuff. <laughs> he doesn't, he can't shrivel up. It's all, it, he can't shrivel up in the nether regions. It's just everything that shriveled. Guillermo, yeah, put it on the poll. Is everything on Tom Coughlin shriveled? Don Lebertard. Dice Clay was the biggest comedian in America at one point, selling out arenas. And he is god awful. Stugatz. Little Miss Muffin. Yeah. That's right. What's in the bowl?
<laughs> Funny. <laughs> you remember the smoking of the cigarette? Of oh, yeah, my the head. smoking yes. of yeah, the yeah, cigarette. Yeah. Little behind Miss Muffet, head. cigarette behind my head. <laughs> this is yeah. It doesn't age well. This is the Dan Levatar Show with the Stugats on ESPN Radio. ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance. Guests on the Dan Levitar Show appear via the Shell Pennzoil performance line. Get instant gold status at Shell. Join the Fuel Rewards program now at fuelrewards.com slash gold. Here's your Sports Center update. Currently embroiled in several cases of sexual harassment and the use of a racial, uh, a racial slur, excuse me, Jerry Richardson announced that he would be selling the Carolina Panthers. Isaiah Thomas will not return to the Cavaliers before did you, Christmas. Did you, just, did you just get even, did you just stumble and get scared because the, just the phrase racial slur was on a piece of paper? It's not so easy. You didn't nail it there. It is not so easy. It's a tough, uh, it's a tough two words for me to string together. I slurred through it is what I, I did. I can't believe you slurred racial slur. I did. Well, I can believe it, and you should believe it. I mean, he made you actually made a racial slur in mm-hmm, slurring right. racial you slur. slurred racially. Yes, a racial slur. Let's get it on the poll. Let, let's get it on the, the scroll. Slow down. Let's get one. it on the scroll. Uh, Stugat in you know embroiled in racial slur controversy <laughs> on ESPN Radio. <laughs> Uh, in case you missed it, Isaiah Thomas will not return to the Cavaliers before Christmas. And finally, a new report from the New York Times reveals that the government dedicated millions of dollars to a secret program exploring the possible existence of UFOs. The Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program was started in 2007 at the request of then-Senate Majority Harry Reid of Nevada and run by a military intelligence official, Louis Elizondo, out of the Pentagon. The government ceased funding the program in 2012, according to the Times, but it remains operational as of today. Elizondo resigned this past October in protest of what he characterized as excessive secrecy and internal opposition following his resignation Elizondo joined Blink 182's Tom DeLong. Here we go. At the To the Stars Academy of Arts and Science. Here we go. For all the latest headlines <laughs> and information, due to the Sports Center on ESPN Radio all throughout the day. <laughs> that is yeah, tremendous. Yeah, it's a yeah. great story. So we've got a lot to get to here in football, and I don't know where to start. I, I feel like it's a little too late to be asking this question because we done started. Um, but I don't know where to begin on Jerry Richardson. First of all, that entire situation up there, Cam Newton, the way that his press conference struck me as odd and nice, actually, but just sort of naive. Right. Um, it was nice. It was actually very nice to see Cam Newton up there as Jerry Richardson is embroiled in controversy that would force him to sell his team because there are reports of just, you know, deviant sexual behavior that we're finding more and more is endemic to. <laughs> rich, rich, powerful people. And so Cam Newton is asked about it after the game, and he was talking. This was the part that surprised me with this. I can really talk to Jerry Richardson like I can't talk to many people. I'm sitting there looking at, I'm like, Cam Newton sees Jerry Richardson as a father figure. And he said it himself. He said, and Cam Newton sees Jerry Richardson as a father figure because they have so much in common. And I'm looking at that, and I'm not even doing book by its cover stuff. I'm, like, trying to figure out what do you guys have in common? And, like, with legitimate curiosity, like, what's the connection there? Right. Um, And because I thought it was weird or weirdly naive that Cam Newton as a quarterback would get in front of the cameras and, in a time of scandal, defend Jerry Richardson as a father figure. When Jerry um, Richardson's got to sell his team because of the nature of the scandal. It was it was kind of odd, man. I hate judging guys in press conferences. Like, it's nerve-wracking right after we, games. Yeah, but we do it a lot to Cam. No, but Cam's not good at it. Like, he's just like he's just clumsy. And I think we all need to just accept that Cam isn't very good at the post-game press conference. He's just not. He says things. Maybe he that, doesn't mean. No, that'd, like, be, that'd be, you know I what? I think he's nervous. No, that, I don't know. No, but that, it doesn't even matter the reasons for it. That is an astute thing for Stugatz to say. Thank if you. a running back, if someone in sports can't do something because they're physically not good at it, like everybody wanted the Cowboys of Jimmy Johnson to be running more screen passes because their offensive line was so good. And he's like, we're not good at screen passes. I'm not going to run screen passes, just get the ball to Emmitt Smith. That's not something we're good at. If we were to just get to the point where it was like, you know what? Cam Newton, 
press conferences and social stuff. We need to just ignore him. Like, anything that happens over there, he's just not good at it. Right. Like, he's not good at the social stuff. He's not good at the press conferences. Just just don't listen to him. Don't ask his opinion on heavy things because he, it, that's just not a strength. It's a weakness for Cam Newton, even though he looks like he's strong at everything. I know everyone's doing optics when when someone like Cam Newton says, I can relate to him in a way uh, that uh, would sure. surprise you. There is something there, because I was struggling to find the connection point. Jerry Richardson was actually a player in the NFL. No other owners can say that. So he can relate to his players on a level that other go. owners can't. There you go. And clearly he was doing things socially that the players who you know dabble in misogyny were doing. Like Jerry Richardson, they were calling him Mr. They were calling him Mr. It's Mr. Richardson. That one, that one, Draymond Green got me thinking about that one the other day in a way. I never thought about it when he was like, get, get the name owners out of here. Owners... Right you know, conjures plantations and slaves. But I, I do, we, and this is not specific to Jerry Richardson, although when Cam Newton is calling him Jerry Richardson, you can, the Mr. feels different or can feel different. Sure. Um, But we do this with rich people all the time. Why do we do that? Why do we afford the rich people all the time the Mr.? The owners are referred to all the time as Mr., as if they're better than us. Are we referring to Jerry Jones as Mr. Jones, I guess? No, in his workplace, I'm sure he is. I'm saying that all of that stuff lopsides people, and next thing you know, they feel like they can tell women how to wear jeans and that, uh, I, I want to shave your legs. Like, that's how it happens. Like, if everyone around you, if you're your lord of your surroundings, you are the benefactor, you are giving money to all, you, everyone, you are your own economy, Jerry Richardson, and everyone around you, even bleeping Cam Newton, refers to you as the illustrious Mr. Jerry Richardson. Yes, Mr. Richardson. Not even Jerry. Yes, he's saying he's a father figure. I don't refer to my dad as father. I don't refer to him as Mr. He says he's a father figure. Mr. Richardson. Why do we do that one? I don't know. It's a good question. I have no idea why we we do do it. We do it all the time, though, correct? We afford the people with money. As ridiculous as if they had a bunch of pineapple. Or power, boss. Maybe it's your boss. Maybe a boss. Yeah. I remember Cam was unusually receptive to, uh, when he was getting drafted, there was all that talk that Jerry Richardson told him, no tattoos, no piercings, don't want that. Correct. The well, that's where, that, that's the first place I was thinking, like, what do you guys have in common? Like, what? He reprimanded you. They, they made you sit for a, they made you sit for a quarter because you were wearing a tie last year. Right. Like the relatable part, that was a bit confusing. Like, what do you guys have in common? The support for Jerry Richardson. No, was that, that be, was cool. Because we've seen, you know, we've seen Matt right. Lauer go down and the no, people on no, that show it, supporting no, it Matt was Lauer. Cool. It was cool to see, but it was also naive and ignores that Richardson's 100%. not the victim here. Right. Considering how receptive Cam Newton was to that advice from Jerry Richardson at the very start of his career, maybe there's something going on, and I think Cam sort of articulated it uh, as such as, this guy taught me how to be a professional. Oh, but I was, I, a, I no, was a kid no, going yeah, into Mike, my I job. Think you're, you're, I think you're seeing everywhere, though, people forced to deal with human frailty in a way that's uncomfortable and that we could all learn from. Thing happens in sports, we all rush to judge. And then Sarah Silverman is there to tell you, hey, Louis C.K. is my good friend. There's a human being there. Jerry Richardson sells with a racial slur and some other controversy. And Cam Newton's there to tell you, yeah, but this is the relationship I have with him. This is a little bit different. And so it just becomes muddled in a way when your friends and the people you love are humanized and the people who have been victims don't care to have them humanized. I don't, they don't, if you've been the victim of sexual assault, you don't want Cam Newton up there humanizing Jerry Richardson, but Cam Newton's going to want to humanize Jerry Richardson because he loves Jerry Richardson. Totally agree, Mr. Levitard. <laughs> I ain't got time to bleed. <laughs> How ridiculous. I don't think anybody calls me Mr. I'm only going to call you I, Mr. Levitard. Anybody <laughs> in my life ever calls me Mr. Don Levitard. See how quick he is at slithering around I'm things? Good. Like, yeah, you are good. You're, you yeah. are a master liar. Stugats. Like, you are, you are a genius liar. You are like uh, the Einstein of liars. This is the Don Levitard show with the Stugats on ESPN Radio. Lane Kiffin has a bowl game tomorrow night. Lane Kiffin is our college football, uh, guy, our college football analyst, because he's, because he's, you know, dirty. <laughs> like us. So Lane's going to be here. He says things. He's going to be here in 10 minutes. Yes. And he says things and it'll be fun. <laughs> uh, I'm wondering if you guys have think of, of this at all. And uh, Guillermo, how close are we to having the, uh, the useless sound montage ready? When do you think you might have that ready? 
We could probably have that ready. If Lane's at 11, we could have it by 11.15. All right, so that's coming up. Stugatz's so weekend observations are coming up as well. But I'm just curious. Do you guys ever have this happen to you while watching football? And I enjoyed the hell out of yesterday. Yesterday was a really fun football day. But do you ever ask yourself, when we're doing all these arbitrary measurements, where there's no difference between 6 and 8 and 8 and 6, and people are being injured, and much of what you're watching is largely random, you know, somebody's going to get into the bottom half of the AFC playoffs who doesn't deserve to be there, and Philadelphia maybe was good enough to win the Super Bowl, but can't because somebody got hurt, or might not because some, you know, the, quarter, the wrong guy got hurt. Right. Do you ever think to yourself while watching this, because I saw this yesterday, we were hyper-examining yesterday, I don't even remember what game I was watching, was it... It was the Carolina game, Carolina-Green Bay game. Okay. And an official in a booth is hyper-examining through replay whether someone's ass cheek landed in bounds. And it was, I I guess it was Pereira. That was probably the big game. It was the Carolina-Green Bay. That was the, uh, I think that was the national one o'clock Fox game. Okay. So they were, but did you see the analysis that I'm talking about where we're going in, zooming in from every camera angle, multi-billion dollar entry, eh, eh, industry, and we're, we're analyzing, we're hyper analyzing where someone, whether someone's right butt cheek landed in bounds or out of bounds. Do you ever look at that situation as you invest more and more into your Sundays and say, God, this is so dumb. Yes. Like what I, the, the way yes. I'm doing this is so stupid. I have, but here's the thing. When I didn't have it, I wanted it. It's a strange thing. Like when I didn't have replay, I didn't have them examining every single little thing about the game, like whether or not there was a catch last night in the Steelers game. I it's, wanted it. Now that I have it, I don't want it as man, much. But it's just so great for the NFL that we care that way. It's just such a great magic trick that allows all of these Jerry Richardsons and Jerry Joneses. And by the way, if you think Jerry Richardson is the last one, <laughs> like, I mean, when's someone going to start investigating Jerry Jones? I don't know that he cares. Uh, I mean, that guy might send you himself the pictures of him in a bathroom with a woman and his pants down. But like, you, I mean, come on. Hey, listen to me. Play the reckless speculation sounder. Just play it. Like, right, I, I mean, right. just play it because we got partnerships with these NFL owners. Time to throw away all journalistic credibility and get reckless. Here is something we like to call reckless speculation. You're good, but be careful. <laughs> Jerry Jones. I care about you. No, careful. I know, but just come on. I know that it's not allowed. You're not allowed to have fun around any of this stuff. I'm well aware of this. That it's, it's a hypersensitive climate. Mr. Levitard, I care about you. Careful. Thank you. Okay, but Jerry Jones, go ahead and sniff around there, investigative teams, because I'm guessing that the smell that comes back is going to be debauchery and Johnny Walker Blue and perfume and sex. And I don't know if under that might be some harassment. I mean, and I don't know where the distinctions are between... Jerry Richardson thinking it's okay to foot massage employees and shave legs and where Jerry Jones draws the line on who he's calling darling or sweetheart. But I want to read the details, even if they're not incriminating. I want to read the details on what Jerry Jones has been doing all of these years with his money and power. Well, I'm glad you were careful. I mean, I didn't do anything wrong. I did nothing I didn't wrong say there. You did. All I did was a. I gave the voice. I mean, everyone had that dirty thought. Everyone in America who cares about football had that dirty thought in their head, and I'm just smoking it out for you. Like you had it there too. You're like, wait a minute, Jerry Richardson was behaving this way. Like he's Bible guy. He's Bible guy. What's the devil himself doing on the blue?